Welcome to this edition of Rally in the Bars. I'm Master Moves, the co host with Eddie Conway. First, let's give you a report on Eddie Conway. Eddie Conway is making remarkable progress. Eddie is sitting up. Eddie is feeding himself. Eddie is getting his physical therapy. Eddie will be back, and we hope in July to be able to continue to do the work that he has been doing. So we thank you for your well wishes and your continued support for Eddie. And more importantly, we thank you for respecting Eddie's family's wishes that he has this space as it recovers. When we think about LGBTQ, when we think about transgender, we think about people that have a right like any other person in society. In a normal society, this is what we think about. But when we look at the landscape and the dis discrimination that's taking place against people they have a, they, uh, decide to have a sexual preference or not to have a sexual preference or to identify themselves however they deem, we have a society that looks down on this. Here to talk about transgenders and the imprisoned industrial complex and why so many people that are transgender are being locked up is Hugh Ryan. He wrote an article uh, talking about this very subject matter, and we're going to talk about why, what's behind people that have a different sexual preference or want to express themselves however they deem it to be, why they're being targeted and locked up at astronomical rates. Welcome, Hugh. Thank you for having me on, man. It's a real honor to get to talk to you. And, and let's, let's start here. Okay. You wrote this article saying that LGBTQ people are disproportionately incarcerated. And then you put on there, here is why. Let's go to the, the why behind it. And before we go into that, we recognize that we live in a society that is, has a lot of homophobia about it. Uh, basically, we live in a society that has a lot of phobias. <laughs> you know, but... This right here, as it relates to uh, the impact that's had on people's lives, large numbers of people, I think that it's being overlooked, and it's being overlooked for a reason. And when I read this article, you really gave the reason why. So let's go. Let's start. Let's start peeling back the why. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, I think you're right. We have so many phobias in this country and they all interact together, you know, and they all come together in the prison industrial complex uh, to really oppress everyone. Uh, what brought me to my research was actually a, a study that I saw that said that 40% of folks incarcerated in women's detention facilities, both adult and youth, identified as LGBTQ. And I just was shocked that I had never heard that 40% of folks in women's prisons identified as queer, that seemed outrageous to me. And then to see that it was the same in youth detention facilities too, was crazy to me. I knew there were lots of reasons um, why gay men were being arrested and why trans women were being arrested, but I didn't know about the arrests of lesbians, bisexual women, studs, butches, transgender men. That was new information for me. And, and so I started to think, why, why? You know. Why? I was reading an interview with you uh, earlier, one that I think you and Eddie had done, and you were talking about how um, this history has been denied to us, and so much history has been denied to us, and how important that is. And that's always my angle, right? I always want to know why something happened. If something is happening, there's got to be a reason. And right. For me, that research took me all the way back to the Civil War, uh, to on. the beginning of the women's detention system in America, which right. I was just shocked to learn about. Um, and, and, what and, I, and, and go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, excuse me. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say what I, what I started to see from the very beginning is that women's incarceration in America was really built around this idea that poor women only have two options in life. You can either be a wife or you can be a maid. 
And both of those things require you to be properly feminine. And so women's incarceration is all about finding women who are not considered properly feminine because they're too masculine or because they're too sexual or they talk back to their parents or they're too black or too Latina or too poor or too disobedient. For all of these things that were considered not appropriately feminine, women would be arrested and incarcerated starting in the 1860s and 70s. So, and, and, and let's, let's dial down on that. Oh, and we know, we recognize that we, we, had, we went through a period in this country with a puritanical uh, period in this country where uh, morality was, was basically looked upon as being the ultimate and that not only probably feminine, but uh, you had a certain etiquette about yourself if you was a female. Mm-hmm. Now, but, but in terms of oppressing women, and oppressing people that are not properly feminine. Can you uh, educate us on how did, what was, the, what was the attempt to get to come out of this? Okay, I'm not properly feminine, so what are you, when you lock me up, what are you trying to get me to mm-hmm. become, or how are you trying to get me to become, quote unquote, properly feminine, or have this puritanical perspective about myself? Good question. I think two big ways. The first one is that we see all of these laws that either get written or enforced on women and not on men. So all of these things, you know, uh, public intoxication or um, prostitution laws, vagrancy laws, all of these, you know, quote unquote, crimes against the public order, that kind of broken windows policing, all of that gets focused on women very early on. So these laws, uh, you know, in New York State, for instance, it was not possible for a man to be arrested as a prostitute in the early part of the 1900s. It was in legal precedent that men could not be arrested as prostitutes. And on top of that, that a woman did not need to exchange sex for money to be a prostitute. She just needed to be considered common and lewd, right? These things that would make no sense when applied to men were applied to women, a whole different standard, because they thought, well, a lewd woman will never be a wife and never be a maid. So she's going to end up being a prostitute or she'll die. So we'll have her arrested as a prostitute, even if she isn't one, because she's going to be one one day. So that's one edge of it. They police all of these behaviors. I found women being arrested for being out alone at night, women being arrested for accepting a date with a man who turned out to be an undercover police officer, women arrested for wearing pants. I mean, these ridiculous trumped up charges that were seen as just not the right kind of woman. And so then once they had you, they put you in jail, often under what were called indefinite sentences, where they were allowed to keep you until they felt you were adequately reformed. And in prison, you wouldn't be allowed to wear pants. You might be forced to take beauty classes or culture classes. You would have to get the approval of the matrix before you would ever get to leave or to have visitors. Uh, At the prison that I was researching in particular, the Women's House of Detention, they weren't allowed to make phone calls on their own. They had to write them out and give them to guards who then made the calls for them if and when they wanted to. Uh, In all of these ways, they policed women to make sure that they adequately behaved, that they were docile, that they were feminine, that they listened to the rules, uh, that they didn't, a big fear was that they would have uh, some kind of sexually transmissible disease that they would pass on to men. So women actually were often incarcerated because they were found to have gonorrhea. And that was kept a reason, even if they were never tried, never uh, charged with anything, never found guilty, you could be kept in a prison hospital for months if you were a woman and you had gonorrhea or syphilis. And, and you know what? The, the uh, hypocrisy behind this is that, as, you, as I was reading this, is here we are, we, we talk about uh, the Afghanistan and the Taliban and the fact that uh, in Islamic culture, in Islamic society, under Sharia law, women are uh, forced to wear certain dresses and, and conduct themselves in certain manners. But here in this country, we're, we're trying to legislate morality. Uh, and it, do you find that it's all rooted in uh, sexism? 
Oh yeah. I think a lot of it's rooted in sexism. A lot of it's um, rooted in these kind of weird places that are sort of like a bit sexism, a bit racism, a bit homophobia, you know, over and over again in the records, black women are presumed to be both more masculine and more sexual by everyone working with them. Right. And that's both racism and sexism and misogyny. You know, it, it just all twirls together in this system. I, I think largely because or, you know, like you go back far enough and like prisons were intended to deal with violent white men. And then as we sort of move forward in time, they get repurposed for social control over women, over black people, over Latinos, over immigrants. Right. And it becomes more and more about how am I going to make them be who I want them to be? Not did someone, you know, uh, steal something from someone else or did the, not that that in itself is also racist in its own way, but the, the sort of experience expansion of the prison system in the, the 20th century is all about these things that like either weren't illegal before or were only illegal when a woman did them or a black person did them. Uh, and so in those ways, it's all rooted in sexism and it's all rooted in racism and it's all rooted in homophobia and transphobia. It just, it all goes together. And you, I, I will say, I see that so clearly when looking at the prison industrial complex, it was really eye opening for me to dig into it and see how it, it never changes, you know, no matter the decade, the administration we are under, the, you know, liberal or conservative moment, uh, these systems are just continually rooted in racism and sexism over and over again. And, and you know, the, the, when we look at this, and before I go into, like, the impact it has on the uh, transgenders or people that are LGBTQ that's locked up, we look at, we look at society, and when somebody make a, a a, a joke and it's deemed to be homophobic. Oh, uh, everybody's outraged, you know, and rightly so. But but then the is the outrage is only given lip service to the fact because the reality is that whoever made the joke might be vilified. But the people that profess to be outraged now, here I'm talking about legislators, mm -hmm. the people that appear to be outraged that come forth and, and speak on this are the same people. That's perpetuating uh, homophobia and trans or transphobia. But mm -hmm. let's look at let's look at in in terms of in in within the prison industrial complex because when you have uh, people that are incarcerated that that have a, a choose to not identify themselves by a particular pronoun and uh, they want to express themselves however they feel they want to express themselves. They're automatically seen to be queer, and and being and if you're a female or um, you're incarcerated and you're a woman incarcerated, you're already being if you're black, you're being discriminated because you're black. Mm -hmm. You're being discriminated because you committed a crime. You're being discriminated against. Then you're gonna be discriminated against because you're saying that your pronoun is 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 representative of your right to have an individual your individuality. However, you want to express your individuality. This is how I want to express mine. And how do, how do you, in your research, the impact that this historical perspective, as, it, as you outlined, mm. what's the impact today in a, in a more contemporary environment? You know, I think there's a lot of impacts. Um, on the, the weirdly sort of positive side, one of the things that I saw in doing this research is that because the prison industrial complex is so unjust against so many people, because it is racist and sexist and transphobic and homophobic, uh, many of the folks that I was able to talk to who are incarcerated in the 60s and 70s said, I learned about other issues through other folks I was incarcerated with, that we worked together to imagine what life could be like beyond the prison system, that we began to see that our issues were connected and that it wasn't each other that we were against, but it was the police and the courts and the legislators who make these bullshit laws. And so that's one way. All of the folks, uh, I, I was talking to folks who were involved in the Black Panthers and the Gay Liberation Front and the Young Lords and the Radical Lesbians, and they said, Prisons were the place where all of their issues came together, where all of them met each other and then went back out into the world and shared that information and worked together and organized together. So in that sense, I, I think that there's unintended effects of the mm. prison that are, are really interesting and exciting. That's I think right. in another sense, though, what we see is like 
I don't know. I don't know. Maybe what you think about this, but I think that like, it's like almost like legislators have gotten really smart and cops have gotten really smart about this. So the law no longer says on its face, oh, we're arresting you because you're a lesbian, but we're, it's, it's buried underneath that, you know, like it might not say it in the law, but that's how the police still approach it. And we see this really clearly in schools today where young people who are gender nonconforming, who are queer or trans or just masculine or effeminate, uh, they are targeted by their peers, by other teachers, and increasingly by these, you know, security guards uh, and the police who are assigned to schools. That targeting, that harassment causes these kids to skip school, perhaps be truant, and then they're suddenly being arrested as wayward or disobedient youth or put into youth detention facilities. And then once they're in those facilities, you know that you're just so much more likely to get rearrested later and to end up more involved in the prison industrial complex. And the laws don't say anything about lesbians, right? They don't say, oh, it's illegal to be a lesbian, but they are still being put on lesbians. You know, they're still being put on trans men. And that, I think, is is one of the hard things about sort of organizing around these things today. So many people are like, oh, well, there's no law that says I'm going to arrest a lesbian. So lesbians must not be a, a, oppressed by the prison industrial complex. And that's that's just not true, you know, but it's they've gotten really smart about it. And, and and you're right about that because we've seen that the the uh, and, and we know we we're, we're dealing with for like a, a real narrow minded uh, society when it comes to people's right to express themselves. Uh, but we recognize also that going back to your point, how legislation I was getting smart about it, when they came up with the same sex marriage, but then on the same in the same voice they say, oh, you have same sex marriage, but oh, you don't have the same rights as mm-hmm. a traditional merge. So therefore your partner can't reap the benefit of a traditional merge should one of y'all pass away. But in, yeah. in the prison- and maybe you live in a state where you can get married, but you can also be fired for being gay still because there's no employment protections. Right, so, and so we recognize the hypocrisy, but in, in the prison industrial complex, and, and to dial down on what you were saying earlier, I, I recognize I was incarcerated for 40 years and most of the prisons I was in, they had they penalized people that had a, a, a different sexual preference. They penal, it was a subtle penal penalization in that they wouldn't let them. They would put them on isolate them on a different tier. Mm-hmm. Uh, make them like wouldn't let them uh, put them where they have a whole lot of interaction with the population in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they would they would make sure that. Uh, they was pretty much isolated, not because they broke any rules or regulations, but because they felt as though morality of the prison population was going to suffer mm-hmm. if a person of a, of a different sexual preference was in the environment and interacted with the environment. But for us, the, those of us that was incarcerated, we could care less because, mm-hmm. like you said earlier, uh, when we when it came down to organizing and and dealing with oppressive conditions and changing oppressive conditions, we found that a lot of people that uh, considered themselves gay, we found that they was our allies in terms of being ready to stand up, and we also came to their aid in, in response to them being discriminated against because we we couldn't stand and say that we wanted uh, equal rights and then say only for men mm-hmm. or only for people that are. Uh, profess their masculinity versus someone that says that, well, I'm gay and I'm proud of it. And then we say, well, like, we want equal rights for us, but not for them. But let's, let's look at, let's look at the, uh, the prison industrial complex as it relates to uh, transgenders being able to uh, advocate for themselves. And, and have, you, have you been able to discern from your article or your research any type of prison advocacy that's going on on their behalf? Yeah, I mean, there's there's tons of great advocacy that's going on right now. Uh, there's a great group called Black and Pink that does a lot of work on these issues. There's a lot of scholars who do work on these issues. Andrea Ritchie, I think, is like a fabulous, brilliant uh, queer woman organizer who writes about the police uh, and issues of policing on queer women and specifically queer Black women. Uh, I think there's just so much great work uh, being done by the Black Lives Matter movement as well, which really I think connects a lot of these issues. Uh, it, it's funny, you know, you were talking about the specialized housing units, um, like the trans housing units, or they used to be called like fairy wings. And in doing my research, 
I found that in, in New York in like the 1920s, uh, when the prison system was mostly white, they actually started making these specific blocks uh, for black incarcerated people. And the NAACP came out and said, we don't want this. And the, the system said, oh, we're doing this to protect incarcerated people. This is to protect black people from racist whites. And both the incarcerated people and the NAACP said, deal with the racism. Don't force us to live in these isolated situations that just encourage this kind of discrimination and this lack of solidarity that you were talking about when people can come together and can talk about things, you know? It's not protection to be forced into 24-hour isolation. That's just never the case. And we see the system has been doing this for all kinds of people, decades after decade. It doesn't work, but they don't change. Right, and, and when... Uh... When we, when we look at, the, as you outlined in history, when we look at the fact that the root of this is you're going to try to legislate morality, and then you're going to make, first you're going to make, like, some, when slavery, post-slavery, you made, you had black laws, you had what they call black codes, mm -hmm. and you would arrest black people for truancy, and when you arrest them for truancy, they wind up working at sharecroppers for, like, the work to build off or the work to debt off, mm -hmm. the debt of the truancy. Truancy might be five dollars. They worked five years working off five dollars because the uh, laws allow for them to use this. And the same thing was is taking place or took place, and it's still continuing to take place right now in a society where you put out laws that say that a person has a certain is not a, have a certain lack of morality. Mm -hmm. And but you don't say you can't legislate morality. You can't say like you we put on the book say because of your uh, transgender or queer behavior, it's a crime. Therefore, this is the penalty. No, what we'll say is like you went back and said earlier. We'll say that uh, vagrancy, mm -hmm. uh, but the, your vagrancy is going to result in you getting locked up. Somebody else's vagrancy going to result in them get up and get up, get get up and keep it moving. Yep. And it's because of the, the morality and legislative morality. But, yeah. and, and, and just like you were saying with the contract labor, I mean, that's the bail still gets treated the same way. You know, they drop like a huge bail on somebody who's been arrested for sleeping on the streets. And then you're in jail for months or years because you can't afford a bail. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Right. And this and, and when the interesting thing about, about your research and your, and, your, and your article is, and I want you to speak on this, is... Uh, People's response, and we look at, we look at, and I'm saying from from the establishment because we have a lot of people that have, uh, what they say, came out of the closet for lack of better description, mm -hmm. right? And they are prominent people, but but yet you don't hear them speaking on this issue. No. Why is that? Is is do you seem do you think that it's a even in this transgender community? Do you think it's a a a, a a classism or elitism in in terms of I'm recognizing that I'm queer. I'm recognizing that, you know, this is my right and I'm, I'm expressing myself appropriately, but economically I'm poor. Mm -hmm. You recognize that you're queer. You recognize your right to identify as such and you might go straight hand. And so you get on TV and say, well, okay, I'm this, and everybody applauds you. Mm -hmm. Do you find that it's an elitist type situation in, in, even in this, in this community? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a, a class aspect to this. I think it's, it's one of the, like, the, the truths about our system of incarceration. Like, as soon as you are incarcerated or even just arrested and found innocent, people don't trust you. And, you know, it's, it's supposedly like, oh, you, you do your time and then, you know, you're, you've done your debt to society, but that's never the case. And so I think a lot of these folks who have positions of power, even in the LGBT movement, you know, they don't talk to or listen to or think about incarcerated people and formerly incarcerated people. And unless there's a law that specifically says, like, we are arresting you for having gay sex, I don't think a lot of mainstream uh, political organizations, LGBT organizations, have done a ton of thinking about like, oh, you know, you, like we were talking about earlier, you're a, a masculine girl, maybe you're a trans person, maybe you're figuring it out, but that's the reason why you are hounded out of school, end up truant, end up in jail. It's directly connected to your gender and to your sexuality, but there's never an easy place in the law that you can point to and say, okay, let's overturn that one particular law. Instead, to fix that, it takes 
takes a much bigger vision, a vision that says this system is the problem. Right. This system is never going to work, right? It's not about, yeah. oh, let's overturn that law. Let's overturn this law. It's a system that's about confining people and taking away their liberty, both while they're in prison and then after they get out many times as well, in order to what exactly? It's not to help them. Uh, and it doesn't improve their lives or help them, you know, get that that young girl back into school and help her get her degree. Right. It's not about justice. It's not about rehabilitation. It's about control. And I think right. that many times that requires a much bigger vision than a lot of mainstream rights organizations that want to talk about, you know, making sure we have equal protection laws or gay marriage laws or, you know, it's it, there's a lot of people that are interested in assimilating into the system, having a place at the table, not flipping the table over. But I think the right, truth right. is we really need to flip that fucking table if we're going to make <laughs> the kind of changes that will help people. Right. And I, and I agree with you 100% because at, at the end of the day, uh, it says that in the Constitution of the United States, they say we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal mm -hmm. and have an unindelible rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. With my Life and my liberty and my pursuit of happiness is being uh, controlled by a system that is designed to keep people subjugated. Therefore, I don't have the right to have freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. And when I'm incarcerated, that right is even more restricted because now I'm being, I was arrested primarily because my transgender perspective or I'm, I'm arrested because I choose to be not feminine. Or oh, mm -hmm. I choose to express myself in a masculine. I want to play football. I want to be a, a guard in a foot mm -hmm. on a football field. That don't have nothing to do with my uh my gender. That just has something to do with I, I feel as though I can do that. But then you say in society that oh because you want to be involved for all male sport, you you queer, mm -hmm. and therefore uh, we're going to treat you as such. We're going to treat you as as if you had some kind of disease. Do you do you think this is is a, a a problem in and of itself? I do. I mean, I think that there's a lot of that, even, you know, even today. And it's it's better than when I was a kid. I think that people are more open to thinking about gender and, and trans identities, and there's more talk about it and more communication. Uh, but there's also this huge backlash. I mean, there's all these new laws that are coming out, you know, banning youth from getting appropriate gender transition services and stopping people from talking about it in schools and stopping people from sharing these histories. You know, I think that over and over again, that's the way our society responds. Uh, a marginalized group moves a little bit forward, gets a little bit of power, gets a little bit of like control over their own lives and destinies. And then we see this backlash, you know, these, these really scary sort of movements, uh, you know, the, the MAGA movement, you know, right now, I think sort of is, is like the, prison industrial complex come to life almost, you know, it's like all of those issues and all of that craziness. Uh, so it's a scary time right now. I mean, on the one hand, there's so much great work being done. And on the other hand, there's so many crazy politicians out there who seem to be just getting crazier and uh, more dangerous by the day. And okay, what do you think that, uh, and we try to come up with uh, some solutions to issues once we identify them. And this is one that has monumental proportion. What are some of the things you think that the community can do or our listeners can do to support our transgender or LBGTQ people in terms of uh, being treated equally and being treated fairly, mainly those that are incarcerated in prison, that's because all those that are marginalized by because of their economics and their lack of socially upper mobility? I mean, I think the very thing that you are doing, this talking to people, connecting people, working together, organizing, like you were saying, inside the prison or outside the prison and seeing how our concerns all match up and all are the same. I think that is so essential. I think for so long, homophobia, racism, sexism have kept so many of us sort of separated from one another and therefore not as empowered to fight the system as we could be if we were working together. And that, I think, is like the crucial number 
number one thing to sort of talk to each other, to educate ourselves and each other, to share this information with each other, to organize together and to sort of say, you know what, we may not always have the exact same issues. We may not know how to talk about these things in the same way. We may come from a different point of view, but like we know who the same enemy is, right? And that's what matters. We've got to work on that stuff. And the places where we don't quite agree or have to figure it out, we can figure that out together, come to see eye to eye, learn to know each other and, and care about and for and with each other and deal with that internal shit while we focus on like really overturning the system. There you have it, the real news about mm. LGBTQ, the history, more important, of how it came up, how the incarceration of people that have the heart the, to express themselves are locked up and put into prison because of their sexual identity. Now we have the real news behind why, and we also have the real news on what we need to do to change this narrative. Thank you, Hugh, for helping us today get with this understanding. Remarkable article, and I encourage everyone to, uh, to check it out. And Hugh, how can people get in touch with you? I'm easy to find on the internet. My name's Hugh Ryan. You can Google me. You see that article. You'll find me on Twitter. Email me anytime. I'm always happy to talk to folks, especially about history. I'm so excited to be here talking with you today, man. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Uh, and we ask everyone to continue to support the real news and continue to support Rally the Bar. We encourage you to subscribe to both. We encourage you to express your views. We encourage you to critique us. We encourage you to get a part, be a part of this process because we bring the real news about events, not the alternative news. We bring you the real news about what's going on with LGBTQ people, uh, the LGBTQ community. We bring you the real news about how they're being discriminated, the classism that exists within this, this community and the elitism that exists. And more importantly, how this capitalist, racist, sexist society is oppressing people and all of us have that in common. We all got the foot on our neck and we're trying to get it all. Thank you very much for joining us and continue to support our efforts.